there's a certain kind of face that just messes with you. Not a monster, not a creature from outer space. It's almost human, but not quite. And that's what makes it so freaky. You spot it, and before your brain can even process what's wrong, your body's already on high alert. This ain't right. Welcome to the Uncanny Valley, a psychological red flag that goes way deeper than creepy robots or weird CGI. It's like your brain screaming, something's off, run. But here's the wild part. Why do we even have this instinct? Why do our brains react so strongly to faces that are almost human? Think about it. Our minds didn't evolve in movie theaters or tech labs. They were forged in the wild, in a world filled with predators, survival, and other humans, and not so human humans. Because long before we were the only humans left standing, we shared this planet with others, Neanderthals, Denisovans, and who knows how many more. Some we made peace with, some we made families with, others, we went to war. So maybe the uncanny valley isn't some modern glitch in our wiring. Maybe it's a ghost from our evolutionary past, a leftover instinct designed to help us tell the difference between us and them. The idea first popped up in the 1970s when Japanese roboticist Masahiro Mori noticed something strange. As robots looked more human, people liked them more, but only up to a point. Then, bam, they hit a wall. Once a robot looked too human but still felt off, people didn't feel empathy. They felt revulsion, dread, like looking at something that shouldn't exist. He called it the uncanny valley. And it's not just robots. Wax figures, hyper-realistic prosthetics, CGI characters with dead eyes, they all trigger the same creepy feeling. Why? Because they look real, but not alive. And here's the kicker. You don't choose to feel this way. It's automatic, a snap reaction. No time to analyze, no time to reason. Your brain hits the panic button before you even know why. So why would nature install that kind of early warning system? Well, instincts this sharp don't evolve by accident. They stick around because at some point, they kept our ancestors from becoming someone else's dinner or worse. Take snakes. Primates, including us, are wired to fear them, even if we've never seen one. In one study, monkeys freaked out over snake-like shapes, even when they weren't real. That's how deep instinct goes. Even the simplest snake-like shapes were enough to set off alarm bells in our primate brains. Why? Because for millions of years, snakes were silent killers. If you didn't spot one in time, you were dinner. And if you couldn't recognize the threat, well, you didn't stick around long enough to pass on your DNA. So here's the big question. Could the uncanny valley work the same way? Is it an ancient hardwired survival system? One designed to keep us alert to a different kind of danger? Not animals, but other humans. Or at least things that looked human, but weren't exactly us. The fact that this instinct exists hints at something big. Somewhere in our deep prehistory, there must have been a real evolutionary advantage to fearing faces that were almost human. Which begs the question, who were we afraid of? Because the truth is, Homo sapiens didn't just wake up one day and own the planet. We stepped onto a stage already crowded with other hominin species, some closely related, others far more distant. And for a long time, we weren't top dog. In fact, we were often the hunted, not the hunters. You think today's African savannas are intense? Back in the day of Homo erectus, it was a whole different game. Picture saber-toothed cats waiting in the tall grass, aggressive hippos ready to crush anything in their path, and crocs lurking in every watering hole. But it wasn't just predators we had to worry about. We weren't the only humans on the block. Our ancestors, like Homo erectus, shared the land with other early hominins, species like Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis. They were cousins, not clones. Close enough to be mistaken for kin, but different enough to be a serious threat if you got too comfortable. Imagine this. You're returning from a hunting trip, worn out, just looking to regroup with your family, and you spot what you think are familiar faces. But you're wrong. They're not your people. And that mistake could cost you your life. And then there were the truly strange ones. Around two million years ago, our world still had Australopithecines walking around, small-bodied, upright-walking primates with chimp-sized brains. 
Visually, they were this bizarre mashup, primitive in some ways, eerily human in others. Now, picture this scene. It's dusk. You're resting by a fire. Your kids are laughing nearby. You glance over and freeze. Something's not right. There's a thin, wiry figure just at the edge of the clearing, gesturing to your child. Your instincts scream before you can think. You lunge for your spear, but it's too late. The creature darts off into the shadows, taking your child with it, and just like that, the uncanny valley stops being an idea and becomes survival. Think parenting is tough now? Imagine raising kids in a world where other species, literal real-life child predators, might have seen your offspring as a snack. That's the kind of world our ancestors had to survive in. Take Paranthropus, for example. These hominins weren't necessarily hunters, but they were always there. Some scientists have even compared them to the cows of our evolutionary tree. Big eaters built for grinding down tons of plants. They might not have stalked our kids, but their presence? Definitely unsettling. They walked upright, looked vaguely human, but something was just off. Huge jawbones, tiny frames, sloped skulls. It was like staring into a warped mirror. Not us, but close enough to raise every hair on your neck. And Paranthropus wasn't the only unsettling neighbor roaming prehistoric Africa. Other apes, more distant on the family tree, also shared that world. Early ancestors of today's chimpanzees and gorillas were out there too, moving through the same landscapes as our ancestors. Fossils from East Africa prove we crossed paths more times than we can count. Now, modern chimps and gorillas might seem shy, especially after centuries of hunting and human dominance, but rewind two million years? Yeah, they weren't the ones running scared. Back then, they had the size, the teeth, and the muscle to hold their ground or take yours. But the real nightmare fuel? That came in the form of other primates that looked like they crawled straight out of a horror movie. Enter Dinopithecus, a giant baboon-like beast with enormous canines and a build that could top 170 pounds in males. Now, imagine that. A massive quadruped crashing through the brush, fangs gleaming, frothing with aggression. You're walking with your tribe, minding your business, and suddenly you hear rustling in the trees. It's not a lion. It's not a hyena. It's a troop of furious territorial Dinopithecus, and there's nowhere to run. And just when you think you've heard the worst, let's talk Therapithecus. That genus is still around today in a much smaller, more manageable form, gelatus up in the Ethiopian highlands, but during the Homo erectus era, these things were giants. They ruled their domain in troops with intimidating size and power. An encounter with them wasn't just dangerous, it was pure chaos. Some of these prehistoric primates got big. We're talking 160 pounds in large males. That's hefty. Especially when you realize that most Homo erectus males were probably tipping the scales at just 130 to 140 pounds. So yeah, these weren't animals you wanted to mess with. But get this evidence from at least one archaeological site suggests that we weren't just victims in this brutal world. We were predators too. There are signs that Homo erectus may have hunted the young of these terrifying creatures. That's right. Our ancestors weren't passive survivors. They were active players in this harsh, unforgiving ecosystem. They had to be. This world didn't give out second chances. And through it all, Homo erectus kept encountering beings that pushed the boundaries of what it meant to be human, faces and forms that were just familiar enough to be deeply unsettling. The roots of the uncanny valley might go back further than we ever imagined. Fast forward hundreds of thousands of years, Homo sapiens is finally on the rise. But guess what? We're still not alone. In Africa, we shared the land with Homo naledi, a mysterious species with a bizarre combo of ancient and modern features. Small brains, human-like hands, and possibly the earliest signs of burial rituals. We've only ever found their remains in one place, the Rising Star Cave System in South Africa. No tools, no campsites, just bones deep in the darkness, maybe left there on purpose. Chilling, right? What's even weirder? 
Despite sharing the continent for tens of thousands of years, there's no sign we ever interbred with them. Not a single trace of their DNA has shown up in modern humans. Like ghosts, they came and went, leaving behind more questions than answers. Head west, and the mystery deepens. In modern West Africans, researchers have found traces of DNA from a completely unknown hominin, a so-called ghost lineage. We haven't found any bones, no skulls, no teeth, nothing. Just ancient genes lingering in the people today. Whoever they were, they likely interbred with our ancestors as recently as 50,000 years ago. We're still waiting for the fossils that could finally show us what they looked like. But if history tells us anything, they were probably another strange reflection in the uncanny mirror. Humanish, but not quite. And then, when Homo sapiens finally left Africa, the world only got weirder. To the north and west, we met the Neanderthals. Strong smart, dangerous. They weren't monsters, they were close cousins, but they were built like tanks and carried a quiet kind of intelligence that still humbles us today. We first crossed paths with them in Western Asia over 100,000 years ago. And from that moment on, our stories became tangled, sometimes in peace, sometimes in conflict, and often in blood. As Homo sapiens continued their journey into Europe, Something fascinating happened. We didn't just bump into the Neanderthals, we started blending with them. Little by little, our species merged. And for a long time, early modern humans in Europe actually kept some distinct Neanderthal traits. But over generations, those features began to fade. They were slowly bred out as Homo sapiens became more dominant. Today, Europeans still carry the genetic echo of that time, on average, less than 2% Neanderthal DNA. Asian populations carry a bit more, but Asia held even deeper mysteries. That's where we met the Denisovans, another branch of the human family tree, and one of the most elusive. For years, we only knew them from scraps, a finger bone here, a tooth there, but recently, we finally uncovered part of a skull. And then there's Southeast Asia, where things get even stranger. This is where we encountered Homo floresiensis, the so-called hobbits, tiny humans with brains like chimps, but tools like pros. And not far away, we found another pint-sized mystery, Homo luzonensis, a small-bodied species with a mix of primitive traits that still baffles researchers. Despite how different all these species were from us in size, in shape, in everything, we didn't just fear them, we connected with them we had relationships with them. We had children with them. That's right. Modern humans interbred with at least three other species. Neanderthals, Denisovans, and a mysterious ghost hominin in Africa. So now the big question is, what does all this have to do with the uncanny valley? If that gut level reaction evolved to warn us about these other almost human species, why were we also drawn to them? Why did we get close enough to form bonds, families, entire hybrid generations? Maybe that's the secret to the uncanny valley. Maybe the reason faces that are almost human make us uneasy is because they also make us curious. It's not just fear, it's fascination, a strange ancient tug of war in our minds. Scientists have a few theories that might explain this emotional cocktail, and most trace back to one thing, survival. One of the leading hypotheses, disease avoidance. In the ancient world, illness wasn't something you could treat. There were no antibiotics, no doctors, and no understanding of how germs spread. A simple infection could wipe out a whole tribe in days. So your brain evolved warning systems, ways to spot the subtle signs that someone might be sick, injured, or not quite right. To ancient humans, outsiders weren't just strangers, they were potential threats. Maybe they carried disease, maybe they brought danger, or maybe in their worldview they even carried evil spirits. And yeah, believe it or not, we may have picked up genital herpes from Paranthropus more than two million years ago. So if you're wondering whether our instincts ever failed us, well, there's your answer. In a world where there was no margin for error, being able to spot the smallest signs of illness could be the difference between life, death, and a nasty viral legacy. Pale skin, strange eyes, 
twitchy or robotic movements, even subtle differences in posture. Those were red flags. And then there's the ultimate red flag, death. A corpse is the perfect example of something that's almost human, but not. Still familiar, still them, but empty, lifeless, dangerous. That brings us to another powerful theory behind the uncanny valley, death detection. For early humans, a dead body didn't just mean grief, it meant possible infection. It meant predators might be close. It meant run. So our brains may have evolved an ultra-sensitive system to distinguish the living from the dead. That eerie feeling we get when we see a face that should be alive but clearly isn't. That's not just fear, it's survival kicking in. That's why horror movies use pale, waxy skin and jerky, unnatural movements to make our skin crawl. They're tapping into a primal warning system, one we've had since the Stone Age. But there's one more piece to this puzzle. One last haunting theory, enemy recognition. Our ancestors didn't just battle lions, leopards, and saber-tooths. For hundreds of thousands of years, they also clashed with each other, other bands of Homo sapiens, and other species all together. Neanderthals, Denisovans, even late surviving Homo erectus. These weren't monsters, they looked almost like us. Just close enough to fool the eye, but different enough to make the gut tighten. And when the stakes were survival, those tiny differences mattered. You couldn't rely on clothes or language. You had to read the face, the walk, the subtle expression. Was that figure in the distance a friend, a mate, or a killer? So maybe that's what the uncanny valley really is, an ancient alarm system. A fine-tuned response forged over millions of years to detect the almost human faces that once haunted our world. And maybe, in some deep part of our minds, they still do. This ancient instinct may have once saved lives. It helped early humans react instantly to a very real threat, other hominids. And that's why the feeling hits so fast, so deep, before you can even put it into words. But here's the chilling question. Could that same instinct have played a role in wiping them all out? It's possible. Everywhere Homo sapiens spread, other human species vanished. Neanderthals, Denisovans, the hobbits, the ghost lineages, gone. Yes, we did interbreed with some of them, but those moments may have been rare exceptions in a much more hostile pattern. Because even today, humans often greet the other with suspicion, with fear, sometimes with violence. Maybe that ancient instinct didn't just help us survive, maybe it also helped us dominate. So where does that leave us now? We live in a world where most of us will never go hungry. We don't fight tooth and claw for territory. We don't share the forest with Neanderthals or scan the horizon for the silhouette of Homo erectus. And yet that fear remains. You still feel it. The chill on your neck when you're alone in a dark room. The unease that creeps in at the wax museum. The moment in a movie when a face moves just the wrong way. That jolt, that's not just fear. That's memory, ancient memory. Because maybe deep down, our minds still remember a world we've forgotten. A world where you weren't the only kind of human. A world where seeing a figure in the dark could mean danger, or worse. And maybe, just maybe, that's why this fear lingers. Because once upon a time, when the shadows weren't empty, that feeling kept us alive. Click on the video on your screen to keep enjoying our content See you in the next video.